Welcome to the show. Today, we have on the line a longtime friend of mine. Uh, and uh, instead of me introducing him, I will let him introduce himself. Uh, good afternoon. What's your name? Where do you live? Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, my name is Dean Pleasant. Uh, I live in the general metropolitan area of Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, my notorious background or somewhat famous background, what I'm known for is that uh, back in 1996, during the then heyday of the militia movement, as some people have called it, uh, I was involved with a militia group, so-called, and uh, we were uh, set about the task of learning and bringing onto ourselves various uh, militant insurgent skills in the event that one day they might be needed to resist a tyrannical government. And uh, in the course of that, we were discovered and arrested and prosecuted, and I was sent away to prison for that for a period of time. Okay. Well, that doesn't sound like much fun. Um, and, and so this was in 96. And so you and I are both, I, we know each other through libertarianish type connections. I remember I first met you at a uh, Liberty Fest, something that Ernest Hancock put on in in Phoenix, and then I saw you at a at a, a party, a voluntarist pal of ours in uh, Tucson. And what is your current uh, political, philosophical? Where where do you stand on things at this point? Uh, I still consider myself a libertarian, uh, or you know, if not a large L libertarian, at least a small L libertarian, for those who understand the difference. Uh, I still feel that in the traditional realm of politics, as they are understood, that libertarianism best describes me and I think is the best political philosophy that has the best last chance to save us within our political system that we currently have. Uh, but maybe more accurately, I'm simply described as a non-collectivist or an individualist, nonconformist. There's a number of things that could identify me, uh, but that gives you a snapshot. Absolutely. There are so many isms in this and that. So uh, I, I, I like that idea. And I, I think it does kind of come down to that foundational level of uh, individualism versus collectivism. So I, I love it. I love thinking about it from that standpoint. Um, and I'm really curious to chat with you because, as you know, about uh, 25 years ago, uh, I got in, or more than that now, I guess, almost 30 years ago, I got into law enforcement and I spent my first couple of years working in a medium security county jail. There were about, uh, I think there were six or 7,000 people in the whole county uh, jail system. But in my jail, there were 1,600 people, and none of them there were the hardcore guys. It was a medium security. But it's going to be very interesting chatting with you and learning about your different experiences and what's similar and what's different to uh, to what it was that I experienced. Uh, so kind of starting with the moment you were busted, how long from the moment of being busted was it until you were actually sentenced and, and landed in prison? Uh, it took about seven months. Uh, we were arrested July 1st of 1996, and it was in early April. So I guess actually it's closer to nine months. It, it was in April when I was finally uh, sent to the federal facility that I was assigned to. And uh, that's actually a relatively short period of time uh, because – we had a strategy of taking pleas to uh, eventually appeal uh, what was a light against us. That's sort of complicated legal strategy that we don't need to go into now. But had I decided to actually go to trial and fight this in the more traditional sense, I would have been held in county jail for probably years. And as you may know, county jail uh, is nowhere near as comfortable often as the eventual prisons people will get sent to. And I personally think that is by design because uh, part of the overall strategy of the justice system is to get you to plead out. Because if you don't plead out, this justice system has to do a whole lot more work. And like anybody, you know, they want to take the path of least resistance. We'd rather encourage people to plead out rather than make us work at convicting them 
So if they can make your initial existence there in county jail while you're being detained and waiting trial, just as hellacious as possible, and you learn while there that things are going to be nicer when you eventually get to your actual prison, some people shorten their experience by just pleading guilty, saying get out of that place and go to the next place. That is an interesting perspective, and I suspect you're right. I, that sounds like a that definitely sounds like a something that the system would do. Uh, and I, I call it a system. It's almost a business. It, it's almost like a a military or not a the military industrial complex we've heard of. It's almost like the prison industrial complex or the the correctional or the. I mean, law enforcement is involved too. But yeah, that that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I've actually, and the reason that I'm interested in this topic is yeah, I heard about this guy recently. Um, what was his name? Ricky Vaughn in Florida. And he's some dude that was just a social media influencer. And he was making these smart aleck satirical memes and uh, trying to get people that had lower IQs to uh, cast their votes by sending a text message to a certain number. And of course that doesn't work, but 50,000 something people did this and he just saw it as a big joke. And then now he got arrested for it. And, and I know that his arrest is, it's part of a propaganda thing to make everybody scared, but long story short, it made me realize that I'm kind of outspoken about some of my ideas about philosophy and, and humanitarianism. And those ideas could land me in jail at some point. And I thought, you know, it might be handy to learn a thing or two about how to prepare for that possibility. And if that possibility happens, how to be able to, to better survive. Um, you were talking some about the trial uh, procedures. And, and as you said, I this isn't a time or place to go deeply into this, but if they want you, as they did in your case, they're going to get you. Is that kind of a good way to boil things down? I think it is. And uh, related to that, you know, during my time uh, when I got to my eventual place of residence, uh, I was, I, I'm just of average intellect and ag- average schooling, in my opinion. I mean, I never even actually graduated high school. I got a GED. I did attend some college, but I really consider myself average in many ways. And yet, uh, as you might expect, when I got to that prison population, I was one of the more educated people. <laughs> right, and, uh, right. And because I was in the law uh, library trying to study how to uh, go forward with my case for my own self-interest, uh, and because my case involved guns and I knew about guns, uh, there were a lot of guys who approached me and said, hey, you know, my case here has a gun element to it, and I would like to attack this element of my case, and I can't pay anybody. Can you help me with this? And because I had the time and I'm sort of a softy, I figured, hey, why not? And so I ended up reviewing a lot of cases. I had the privilege, like an attorney, to look at uh, the interworkings of so many different cases. And what I discovered there, shockingly, although it's not shocking to me anymore, is that I could not find a single case that did not involve official corrupt practices at some level somewhere where the judiciary or the law enforcement element at some point with a wink and a nod knew that somebody was misbehaving and acting outside of the rules. But because we have to get these criminals any way we can, as long as it's not so egregious that it captures a public eye, we're just going to let this slide. And you know, we hear about this uh, in movies and things like this. And I had always assumed it was sort of exaggerated. My father used to be a police officer. I have a lot of respect for law enforcement, uh, which was sort of an odd position to be in, being there inside prison. But uh, I had certain assumptions about to what degree there was uh, fastidious and moral action on part of the authorities and there was not nearly as much as I expected there to be. Uh, I, I think that today, because the judiciary allows it and does not specifically seek it out to punish it, that there is a lot of this uh, misconduct on the part of law enforcement and prosecutors that many people realize. With good intention in their hearts, I'm sure. But uh, anyway, make a long story short, there is almost no one put away, honestly. And so I agree. If, if they want to get you, they will get you is the answer to your question. 
Yeah, I I suspected as much. I, it's it's how I've felt for years. I yeah, I think we're on a pretty similar page there. And speaking of a GED, uh, hey, we're the same. Uh, we're the same boat. I I never bothered going to high school, so that's what I got too. So that's that's great. Um, and, and I don't want to be misunderstood here. I mean, let me tell you that of the people I met there in prison, uh, a great deal of them belonged there, and, and almost everybody who I met there actually did something to get themselves there. I'm not saying that they're innocent people. Uh, right. Merely right. that the way they were put there was not in line with the principal conduct we expect. Right, right. So when you were uh, sentenced, it was, it was only nine months or so, uh, were you incarcerated the whole time or were you let out on bail? Well, no, I was never let out on bail. And that was a political uh, decision because uh, you have to understand, you know, the president himself, Clinton, stood on the White House lawn and talked about us when our arrest happened. It was a big deal. Okay. Uh, and we were claimed to be militants that had supposedly intention to attack uh, various places. And so, no, we were never going to be let out on bond, although some of us were, those who had uh, less evidence against them, uh, which was really those who had not been present as much during certain meetings that were recorded. Uh, yeah, and so I was there the whole time, and then I was even denied uh, uh, early release, you know, parole. I didn't get supervised release. Uh, they made me finish the entirety of my sentence that I was supposed to do. Uh, you know, normally in the federal system, I think still this case, that uh, you can have up to six months of early release into a halfway house as part of your transition into regular civilian normal life again. And a lot of people, that is viewed as important to be able to reintegrate. And they just didn't care about that with me. They're like, nope, you're going to stay here as long as we can hold you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they, they really didn't like me. And the reason they didn't like me is because I was unrepentant. Uh, and I was specifically so. I uh, This sort of leads into the overall, uh, you know, how does one maintain their sanity and uh, clarity of mind in the middle of something like this? But I considered my time there as sort of a mere extension of my mission that I felt I was on that got me involved in all this. Uh, number one being, you just never give them the satisfaction. And I knew just at a deep uh, uh, intuitive level that uh, intu uh, yeah, intuition, that's the word I'm looking for. Anyway, uh, I knew that I could not allow them to see my head bowed over this. I made a conscious effort while I was there, whenever I encountered the prison guards or anybody else in the administration, that I was having a good day, or if not a good day, I wasn't having a bad day. I, I just was not bowed. And that really twerked them. It, it really set them up. <laughs> That's Which, great. Yeah, they, what they want is a submission. A for me. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> I bet. And it is that submission. It's that kowtowing that... Um, I recall as a cop, it, it, the whole contempt of cop idea of, I don't really care if you sit on the curb or not, but if I'm out on the street and I say, hey, sit on the curb, and you don't sit on the curb, that's contempt of cop. So even if you had a better solution that I could feel safe and you would be in a, the right place, no, it, it was uh, submission is what the system, and when I was part of the system, that's what we we wanted so yeah I can completely yeah I, I can that makes sense um, so I don't imagine when you were sentenced and they said okay you're going away for however long I guess I haven't asked you that um, you didn't get to choose where you went right they could send you anywhere in the country is how how did that go well typically the way it works is you know one of the more humane uh, things that the Bureau of Prisons does try to do uh, they do try to take in consideration. Uh, your family that is left behind and their ability to visit you. It's also considered important for your later integration that you have family ties and maintain them. So typically, they will try and put you in a facility near where your family resides. But there were 12 of us in our case, and they looked at us as a potential prison gang, if you can imagine, because we were militants and we were trained in uh, things military. Uh, potentially including escape and evasion or harming the guards. They didn't want any of us in the same location. So they split all of us up to go to 12 different facilities. Wow. And, and because of that, some of us were not allowed to be near home. So we ranged all the way from Oregon to Texas in these various different places. 
Uh, I was sent to Lompoc, California on the, on the coast there, uh, which, you know, it could have been worse. You know, I mean, they could have sent me to New York or someplace like that where it was really difficult to visit me. But right. I didn't get all that many visits because I was that far away. Right. Okay. So once you once you got there, I recall at least in the county jail system, there was a a classification process when, during intake. When an inmate would come in, we'd say, "Hey, what's your deal?" And there's a whole interview process because you wouldn't want to put rival gang members in the same room together. Did you go through something like that? And and uh, how, how did that work out? Uh, not at the county level. Uh, in Maricopa County, which for those who don't know. The, the county which Phoenix is in, Maricopa, in surface area, is one of the largest counties in the nation. Uh, it rivals L.A. County for its size and population of its jail. So it's a big deal there. And they just throw everybody in together and they almost don't care. But when you finally get classified federally to go to a federal institution, uh, they rate you as to what security level of facility you need to go to based on a number of factors, principally how long is your sentence. Because the longer your sentence, the more desperate you may be to try and do something stupid like escape or something like that. And uh, also, whether there was violence in your conduct, whether uh, there was uh, any number of factors. And it may be different now, but at that time for mere gun violations, uh, I ended up going to a low security facility, which was only one step above minimum security. Minimum security was, they don't even have a fence. Uh, it's essentially a camp and you're there on your honor and you could walk away, but life will be really bad for you when they catch you later if you walk away. Low is where you actually have a double fence with razor wire and you're you know, uh, held in there, but you have a greater degree of movement, a little bit more privileges. Uh, it's just more humane of an existence than if you went to medium or high or super max. Okay. Okay. And so you, what was the actual room like that you're like, were you in a, a cell with one other person or were you in a big common area sleeping situation or how, how was that? Well, you know, that varies from many different facilities. Um, the first facility I was sent to at Lompoc was actually a former Marine Corps armor base that they had converted. It had been closed down. They no longer had tanks and, and soldiers there. But they had the uh, officer's bachelor quarters, which was a big barracks type of building in a U-shape that had a kitchen attached to it. And they just put razor wire around that. And that was the low security prison where I was at. And these bachelor officer quarters used to house uh, six officers, three sets of bunk beds in a large room. And that was where my uh, first residence was in this group with uh, five other guys in this rather large room that didn't really resemble a cell, uh, except for the bars on the windows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that goes a reminder a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I was there for about seven months. And uh, at this particular time in the history of the uh, United States Bureau of Prisons, they were beginning to experiment with the idea of private prisons. And could private prisons contracted to the Bureau of Prisons provide a cheaper, safer, better uh, prison experience, either for the prisoner or the, for the bureau. And there is that's a whole other show you could do about how that did or didn't work and why. But uh, I ended up, after only seven months at Lompoc, they sent me out to Taft, California, which is near Bakersfield. It's a, a oil area. You can taste oil on the air when you're there. And uh, <laughs> that's where I spent the remainder of my time at this private uh, prison run by Wackenhut Corporation. Okay. Uh, Wackenhut Corporation was primarily known before this for being the private contractor for nuclear power facilities. So they have a previous relationship with the government of being a pseudo law enforcement agency where they are officially allowed to be armed with heavy weapons and things like this. And they decided to branch out into the private prison uh, uh, industry, which was dominated at that point, and I think still is today, by CCA, uh, Corrections Corporation of America. Uh, and actually, for a short period of time, I was in one of those facilities uh, when we were pre-trial. I, I was at county for most of the time, but then for a short period of time, I was at a CCA facility in Florence, Arizona. So I actually have a unique experience with private prisons from the inside. Right. You got to, you got to do a big taste test of many of them. Yeah, um, you could say that. So getting kind of to the 
Being on the inside, I, I recall that in my county jail, every so often, the there would just be rumblings of a problem or, you know, some inmates would be getting in fights and we couldn't figure out who did it. And so the sergeant or lieutenant would say, you know, well, let's go shake those barracks. In other words, search them. So uh -huh. we'd get 20 deputies together and burst in all of a sudden, make everybody get up immediately, go stand outside, and then we would quote unquote search the barracks, but the, the real reason we were there is to mess everything up and throw it on the floor. And, you know, we're, we're looking for contraband, but in truth, we were just destroying all of their property and confusing it with everybody else's and, but, you know, putting whole stacks of letters, tossing them all in one area. So nobody knew whose was what. And, and so the reason I'm bringing this up is one of my thoughts is if I end up going to, to, prison to jail, I would like to try to keep a positive attitude. I don't know that I could keep as positive of an attitude as you did. I've just for years, I've been so impressed with you, but I would like to make use of that time and write a book or two. What would be your idea or suggestion? Is it possible to do something like that? Or is your stuff getting searched every few days and it's going to be destroyed anyway. Should I mail a letter once a week to, with the latest chapter? Or what are your general thoughts about all that blabbering I just did? Well, it is absolutely true that in any institution worth their salt, they are going to be searching uh, those materials on a regular basis. Uh, my experience wasn't that they were doing it for destructive purposes. They were just legitimately trying to maintain security and would on a somewhat routine basis, although never predictable when, would uh, select you know, my area and go through it and see what was there, if anything. And obviously they would search some people more than others because they tend to be troublemakers or whatever. And if you did become a problem for the institution, I imagine, yes, you would probably get some harassment type of activity like that. But for myself, uh, although it was a bother and, and, and uh, I'd rather, you know, they did something more productive with their time. Yeah, that happened on a, a regular basis, but it wasn't, uh, nobody was trying to mess with me. You know, my stuff was gone through and kind of put back sometimes maybe, uh, and nothing was ever really taken unless it was some sort of investigative lead. And that certainly could happen. Um, uh, and, you know, fortunately everything about my case was already known. There was nothing hidden. There wasn't anyone that I might be trying to converse with on the outside who may have been involved and not been, uh, touched by the investigation who they'd want to know about. So it wasn't like they're going through my stuff to try and discover other people or discover other crimes, although they will do that with you if they have reason to believe. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, for instance, I wrote a, a newsletter home on a regular basis simply because I had so many people to write to that if I wrote individual letters to everybody, I would never be doing anything other than writing letters. And uh, I wanted to stay in contact with everybody. It was mentally helpful. And uh, so I created this newsletter format. And uh, so I would be updating that throughout the week and finally do my final form, make copies of it, send it to everybody. And yeah, they would find that and read through it, which is why I was also very careful to never put anything in there that would say, oh, I feel like hurting these guys or anything like that. You know? Right. <laughs> uh, you always have to be aware that if you are you know, doing something uh, like writing a book or, or putting anything down that could be documented, just make sure it's not anything that you care about other people discovering. Privacy uh, is gone, huh? Yeah, privacy is gone. And if it's not with the people who run the facility, it is with the people you live with. Because I was fortunate in that because my case was on the news and television, everybody who I met when I got there already knew who I was. And they felt they already knew what my case was and what my situation was. So I had no secrets which is an unusual situation for anybody going into prison because normally everybody looks at you suspiciously. They wonder, are you somebody who is going to try and get close to somebody else to find out their secrets to then contact the prosecutors and cut a deal to shorten your sentence? Everybody's paranoid about that. Maybe you're actually an undercover cop who's in there just pretending to be a convict. But I didn't have that problem. People knew who I was. That's part right. of the reason why people talk to me more readily. Uh, and why guys would approach me with their case. They could trust me because I was a public figure of sorts. Uh, and that was unique. I mean, I, I, 
hardly anybody else is going to have that. But then again, depending on your political activities that land you in prison, maybe you will be too. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that yeah, that is an outlier. Yeah. So uh, something I kind of noticed was that there were certain inmates that I'd say out of every hundred that I met, and no, out of every three hundred, there was one that was articulate and intelligent and was a, a sharp cookie who, you know, had we met under different circumstances, we could have been pals. Uh, however, in the county system that I was in, you didn't want to be seen talking to a deputy because if you were, people just assumed you were ratting them out. Was it the same in your experience? To a degree, yes. Um, first of all, I can tell you that at the federal level, because of the types of uh, crimes that the feds concern themselves with, which uh, is a higher degree of financial crimes, and con games, and things like this, you run into a higher percentage of intelligent people than I think you would find at the county level. Uh, but at least in the private prisons I was at, uh, it's important to note that the guards there uh, were not professional prison guards. Uh, at the particular uh, facility I was at in, WAC, in, uh, in Taft, California, just months before, they had been oil workers out in the fields, and the oil industry had plummeted recently. A lot had been laid off, and they became prison guards because there was nothing else to do. And so they were more like regular average people than them. You know, they, it wasn't right. the versus them that you typically find in a prisoner and prison guard relationship. Now, they still, of course, had their duties, and over time – they're developed that us versus them dynamic. But initially, uh, it was somewhat odd because for people who had been institutionalized and only knew the us versus them dynamic, they ran into these people who still treated you with enough respect and would damn near shake your hand. And prisoners who'd been down for 10, 15 years didn't know how to deal with it. They're like, well, what the hell is this? Right. <laughs> uh, but because of that, after people became comfortable with where they were and what the situation was, it wasn't uncommon at that facility at that time to just kind of be hanging around and discussing with the guards. But that doesn't mean people weren't watching you. They certainly were. Uh, it, it, it would be better if you were having a conversation with the guard, at least have one other guy there with you. Uh, the more the merrier, just so no one could make an accusation that, well, he was ratting out this guy or he was talking about that. Uh, for myself, I didn't really have, I didn't have a problem discussing things with the guards and they actually often wanted to talk to me about other things and didn't get into that. That's a bit of a long story, but uh, uh, I found that part of what kept me out of trouble was, you, you know, you do a number of things. You stay away from the drugs, you stay away from the gambling, you stay away from the sex. And if possible, you hang out with the older crowd because the older inmates tend to be more wise, even if they're not well-educated, even if they've been a career criminal their whole life and are not smart in that way, they're wise enough to at least know how to get along in there. And they tend to not act as stupidly as younger people. Uh, I was apparently intelligent enough that despite my youth, they didn't mind me hanging around. And that was just a better social dynamic within that unique society to hang out with. Right. That makes good sense. I had never thought of that. Good, good point. Yeah, that's, I'm trying to look back in my experience and yeah, those guys were, they were respected even by the deputies, the the older folks um, mm -hmm. and just kind of left alone because they're not out trying to raise any problem, you know, rowdy, rowdy up the place at all. Um, so how about the other inmates? Um, what was it like, you know, in the, all the prison movies on TV when you first walk in? And it was true in the jail I worked in. When the, the new person would come in, everybody would yell, new fish, new fish in the tank. And everybody would beat on their bunks and hoot and holler and just trying to scare and intimidate. Um, kind of like a gang jumping somebody in. It's just kind of your orientation. It's your hazing as you enter the place. Did you experience that kind of stuff at the federal level? Not at the federal level. At the county level, I did. And again, this gets into the type of characters that are in a particular place. You know, a county, you have everybody from accused murderers to shoplifters. So the, the toughest and the honoriest are going to be the ones who set the tone for that little miniature society. 
the, the way the feds had organized everything by these security classifications, the people who exist at the low security facility where I was, uh, again, the whole situation was a bit more relaxed than if you were in a uh, darker, meaner prison. And, uh, and for instance, I mean, when we would get new people in who transferred down out of medium security and were allowed to progress into low security, uh, usually because their sentence has progressed far enough, they've served enough years as a reward for behaving, they let you go to the low security. I would see these people walk in off the bus and they literally had this walk of hardness where they thought they had to pose and show they were tough because that's what they had to do where they came from. And that would last about two weeks before they finally figured out, no, it's different here. I don't need to do that. People can exist here uh, more like a regular society. You know, every drop in security classification facility, you got just a little bit closer to normal society. And uh, which, which I think is a smart thing, really. Uh, whether they ever intended it that way, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I, I remember guys specifically I met who, when I met them during their first week, they were just kind of nasty. They weren't friendly at all. And you'd meet them a month later and they had chilled out. They were totally different. Uh, so, you know, this could, you know, speak to the larger psychology of uh, nurture versus nature and all that sort of thing. I, I don't know enough to comment about that, but uh, I do know that when you allow inmates a little bit more responsibility, a little bit more freedom, as long as they don't abuse it, and uh, it's usually positive. Yeah, you know? okay. Yeah, for instance, in the minimum security where they don't even have the fence, uh, oftentimes the prison jobs that people will be assigned to there have to do with uh, supporting the higher security facilities. So for instance, uh, a lot of time these facilities will have their own farm or water treatment facility uh, and someone at a minimum security facility might be tasked with driving a, a milk truck to go deliver milk from that farm to the other prisons where people are behind the fence. And they actually, if they're a trustee, if, they, if they've shown that uh, they can handle this responsibility they're given, they have a limited ability to you know, go back and forth between these facilities. And uh, they meet guys like us who are behind the wire, and we have a limited amount of conversation and interaction with them and we learned about how things are over at the other facility you know right and uh, it, it's it's an important little news network before the internet <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah and sometimes you know guys just couldn't take it you know some, some guys would uh, have the opportunity to walk away so they did and they'd escape sometimes they did successfully never came back usually they found them uh, we had a guy who escaped from our facility right out through the visiting area and they never found him. He's back in Mexico somewhere. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, how about the, and we've talked about this some, uh, and your facility is going to be different than some of the others, but maybe you could also include what you heard about from the medium and higher security places. Um, is there a lot of fighting and stabbing and, and is it just a dangerous place that if you look wrong at somebody, you're probably going to get stabbed within a week or what was, what was your experience well, this, and what did you learn from others? This stratification of different facilities, uh, you can separate it not only by security stratification in the federal system, but also simply between federal and state prisons. You know, the state prisons tend to handle what are state crimes, which are burglary and assault and murder and things like that. Whereas federal crimes tend to be uh, the ones that involve financial crimes or smuggling or something like that. There's not as many violent people in federal custody, which is not to say there are not violent people, just not as many. So the character of the facility is different. I had talked to other people who had been to state facilities where yeah, that was as Darwinistic as you can imagine because of who was in there. And, uh, you know, the inmates are running the asylum pretty much from what I heard. <laughs> right, it was, right. It was a barely contained violent anarchy in most state prisons. So if you have to get sent away to somewhere, this is one thing I learned in experience, you know, for someone, if you have to go to prison, I ended up at a place that was really not that bad. <laughs> and I was actually somewhat appreciative of it. Right. Yeah. Well, and that was my experience also, is you want it county and fed would be okay, but you didn't want to go to state, especially one of the, the bad places. Um, yes. Interesting. Um, 
So what about everybody would call them rape houses? That's what a prison is. What did you hear about from the medium security places? And this probably goes back to if somebody is a serial rapist or sodomist, they're probably not going to go to federal pen. They're probably going to go to state pen. Was that, did that kind of hold true there as well? It, pretty much, although, uh, and, and not that I met any, but I can easily imagine that there may be some people who did this sort of thing across state lines and therefore were picked up by the feds and are in some sort of fed facility, uh, but they are in a much uh, smaller percentage than you would find at a state facility. And because of the violence of that sort of activity, I am sure that they were at medium or high security facilities where I did not get an opportunity to meet those people. Um, but we did have, where I was, some people who had been charged with uh, children crimes and who, because they had served long enough at the upper security levels, were now finally at low. And people knew who they were because it, it's it's a it's sort of like a sewing circle of gossip. It's the main activity of inmates to find out who is who, especially in the new people coming in, what's their story. And it's almost impossible for someone to arrive there and not have known why they're there. And when these people would arrive, uh, they were in danger because part of a low security level is that there is a great deal of open society there behind the fence. There is not as many portaled or closed off spaces. And uh, if someone there really wanted to harm a child molester who happened to be there, they easily could. What prevented that from happening primarily was the privilege you had of being in a low security facility. Because uh, if you hurt a child molester, while other people may look at you as not really doing anything wrong in doing that, uh, the administration, of course, has to punish you for it. And you will then immediately go back up to a medium or high security and maybe have years added to your sentence. So these guys tended to be left alone. But if you were found to be talking with them, that was much more uh, a taboo than talking with the guards. Uh, if you were to socialize with those people, you then taint yourself and whatever trust or positive points there in the society you may have had prior to that, you have now detracted yourself. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I, I can't say that I ever, I, I, even as far as consensual sexual activity there, I really didn't see that that much. I can't say I saw it at all, actually, but I only know of a few people who were openly gay, for instance, who uh, were perfectly happy to advertise that they were and invite anybody to come enjoy that with them. Uh, but I never actually saw it. And I, and I don't know of any rape that occurred where I was. And I think that was a function of the fact that everybody, almost everybody there was on their way out into the lower classification and didn't want to screw that up. Right, right. Well, and then I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to be uh, maybe uh, already answered, but I, I was thinking about the different races, uh, the, all the racial issues. And there were certainly, in, at the county jail I was in, you had the, the, the white guys, they're called Peckerwoods. And then you had the blacks, you had border brothers, which were Mexicans just across the border recently. And then you had Chicanos, which were second or third generation uh, Hispanic people. And then just kind of an other category for Arab people or uh, Vietnamese or Chinese or whatever. And so there were kind of these different racial groups. And then there was a heavy that was at the top of each of those groups. It was an inmate, and this is all informal jail politics, but the heavy was kind of responsible for the behavior. So the, the Chicano heavy made sure that all of the Chicanos didn't mess up while they're in there. And if the deputy had a problem, he would go to the heavy and the heavy would then take care of the problem with the, with one of his people. Were there those kind of politics where you were, or was that not there? Somewhat. Somewhat, but probably not to the degree that you observed where you were, uh, because as I say, the, this whole stratification of security level was designed to try and get you to a slightly more civilized place in preparation for eventually getting to where you get released. And these privileges that you had at the lower security level, uh, nobody wanted to ruin. And so there just was less opportunity for someone who wanted to live that role of being the heavy to enforce themselves in that way. Uh, People had a little bit more individual liberty, as odd as that sounds. And so there was less opportunity for a tyrant like that 
to seize control. Uh, so, but there was some of it. Usually these guys who tried to have that role at the low level where I was were guys who had previously had some sort of role like that at the higher security levels. And they just sort of inherited it and didn't really know any other way to act when they finally got to the low security, but found that the dynamics there were different and it just didn't quite work the same way. And the uh, same thing had to do with race relations. You know, from what I had been told and, and led to understand, yeah, there was very strict enforcement of the race relation rules, whatever they may be, at the higher security levels. But where I was, that was almost non-existent. People still tended to hang out with their own racial clan, but it wasn't prohibited to interact with others, uh, provided, of course, that if anyone asked, why are you hanging out with that guy? You could articulate some sort of uh, reasonable explanation. My involvement in the law library, as I said, talking with other people, I had people of all different races uh, because of the guns involved in their case come to me and ask about gun law. Uh, so that was a reasonable thing to explain away my interacting with almost anybody. Uh, and again, it also helped that I was a person who my case was known about. People felt they knew my history. So I wasn't deemed as much of a threat either racially or that I might learn details to rat on somebody and reduce my own sentence, that sort of thing. Uh, but I did on at least one occasion run across a couple of guys who I had previously been friendly with who were of the white identity politics. And uh, we were sitting in my cell one day. They were visiting with me. And a black fellow who I was friendly with happened along and wanted to talk to me. And he stepped into my cell because he knew he was allowed to, you know, because I had said, you know, whenever you want to, you can come here and talk to me. Right. The, the racist guy, the white racist guy who was already sitting there with me, got very tense. And this was a faux pas on his part. The, guy, the, the black man who came in to talk to me, he finished talking to me what we were talking about, and then he left. And then the racist white guy sitting there with me says, why did you allow that? And I told him, I said, well, look, you know, uh, I'm not like you. I was honest with him. I said, look, I, I respect that you are how you wish to be. And I'm not going to tell you, you can't be the way you want to be. But I've never been like you, and I'm not going to be like you. And you need to remember that when we have this little friendship between us. If a black man wants to come and talk to me about something I'm willing to talk with him about, I'm going to do that. Now, I could get away with telling him that there at that level. But had I said that same thing, maybe at a medium or high security level, that might have been an invitation to violence from the from the Becker Woods. Right. But where I was at that time, I could say that boldly and establish that boundary. And uh, and I and I was a little bit nervous when I told him because I knew I, I knew what he was concerned about. But he had never been violent to me and we got along pretty well up until that moment. And he didn't like it. And he didn't come around as often afterward. But nothing really came of it. Okay. Wow. That sounds like you handled it beautifully. That's impressive just to hear. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad it did work out well and you didn't get shivved uh, for that. <laughs> um, so how about the food? Getting on a, on a more oh. cheerful note, maybe, um, was the food good in taste or was it like county food that is just high fat, delicious, tiny amounts, bland but uh, I say bland and delicious. Some some food was so bland at the county level and others, my gosh, the carrot cake was the best carrot cake I've had in my life. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what was your experience? Well, as I said, uh, at some of these uh, federal institutions and even at some state institutions, uh, they have their own farms, their own uh, supply chains to try and mitigate the cost from, you know, buying, you know, and just spending county dollars or state dollars. Uh, so the food did improve when we got to the federal system, but it improved even more when we got to the private facilities. And th that was a unique dynamic, I think, because the private facilities, as I said earlier, were in this transitional uh, uh, audition period with the feds to try and show that they were a good option and that they should be contracted with. And so to show the feds that they were a good option and a good choice, they wanted to have the inmates be as happy as you can have the inmates be. And one of the things is you feed them as well as you can afford to feed them. And it worked. We, we ate really well the first year I was there. But, and again, I'm trying not to get too complicated about the outside dynamics of this one particular experiment with private prisons, but uh, there were administrators in the Bureau of Prisons who wanted this experiment to work. 
And then the foot soldiers, the guards in the Bureau of Prisons, saw it as a threat to their union lock on everything. And they wanted the experiment to fail. And so there was a tension between administrators and foot soldiers as to how things were really going to work. And then you had the private contractor themselves who wanted it to work, but had to try and satisfy both sides. So there was sabotage from the federal guard unions and encouragement from the federal administration. And uh, what eventually occurred was that so many different rules and all sorts of different ways were put on Wackenhut uh, in how they were supposed to run the place that they were no longer running as profitable as they were when it began. And the number one expense in a prison is the food. Uh, it's more than labor for paying the guards. It's, it's more than anything else. And so the number one way to trim costs and increase profit is to degrade the food, which did happen during the three years I was there. It was great at first. And by the time I left, it was worse than anywhere else. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Well, and then now, years later, you're an entrepreneur in the food space. So that's an interesting uh, twist of things there. So uh, now you get to do what you want. That's... Uh, that's, oh, I mean, uh, and, and here's just a little funny aside. Years ago, I used to work at a donut shop. And uh, when we got there, I was on only the second busload of people to this brand new facility. The feds had built it and it was supposed to be run by federal guards, but then they brought in Wackenhut to run it. But it sat still for about three years with nobody in there. And uh, so there weren't that many people when I first got there. And so the very first jobs they assigned to a whole lot of people was in food service to serve the inmates around the cafeteria. I walked in there and I saw this brand new, unused, multi-thousand dollar automatic donut making machine back in the kitchen that somebody at the federal level had decided would be a good purchase. Uh, <laughs> if you know how to run it, that is. Nobody knew how to run it. And <laughs> I'd already spent years making donuts and didn't want to make donuts anymore, but I had made the mistake of talking to somebody on the bus before we got there about, oh yeah, I used to work in a donut shop. They saw that machine and they volunteered me. They said, oh, he knows how to run that. <laughs> Look at Dean. Go say, yeah, go talk to Dean. I want some good donuts. <laughs> right. But so did you the, end up the, having to be the, the forced labor donut maker I, for a while? I was. I was the guy who had to fire that sucker up and get it running the first time and then teach other guys how to run it. But eventually, as I said, when everything degraded, even the donut batter was too expensive to buy. And so they just mothballed it and they never used it after the first year. Huh. Yeah, there's a little example of federal waste for you. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm I have, I'm pausing here because I'm having to pick my job off of the floor. I can't believe the feds would waste money, huh? Interesting. <laughs> um, so, what are some? You've given some good tips. Like I love the idea of hang out with the older guys. What are some other uh, some good advice? If you if I told you, hey, I got to get off the phone in three minutes because they're coming to the door to haul me away. What are some, just kind of the boiled down summary, what's some good advice that a person could uh, could know before they go or prep before they go? Oh, man, you know, there's almost no way to prep. Uh, I, I can simply tell you that uh, your, your frame of mind to get through it is what's most important. You know, in, in military circles, they will say that your mind is your primary weapon. It's true. And it is also your primary survival tool in any situation, including this. Um, when I first got picked up, um, when I, while I realized that I knew I was risking this happening to me when I was involved in the whole militia movement, uh, and I did that willingly, obviously I didn't, I, I wasn't expecting it and, it, and uh, I wasn't truly prepared for it. And uh, having come from a law enforcement family and at one point had thought that I wanted to be in law enforcement myself, to now be in prison for uh, an undetermined amount of time until they sentenced me. Uh, I mean, I didn't know what my future held. Everything was, it was just a dark tunnel I was staring into with no light at the end. And it was after about three months of being in initial custody before I finally began to be experienced enough in how to exist there that I began to see that I could actually do it, that I could see a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so you can expect that, yeah, you're going to have despair at first. That's normal. Uh, it's expected. Uh, but how you deal with that despair, how you look at the potential of your future will determine everything. 
Uh, and from that positive attitude that hopefully you gain, you can then think smartly about who you will associate with or not, you know, what you will do or not. Um, and there are books written on this subject by other people who have been to prison. Uh, my defense attorney at the time, when he realized that despite his best efforts, I was probably still going to go away. He suggested some of these books to me and uh, my parents bought some and sent them to me and they were interesting. Uh, I don't know how helpful they were, but mostly they seem to have been written in a humorous vein, telling humorous stories about why they were there uh, because that's what's uh, in those people's minds, but they didn't have a whole lot of practical uh, advice as you're asking for. Uh, so I can only tell you that, uh, you know, having friends and family is also very important. I, f I found that there were people I expected to be beside me during this trial in my life who were not. And then there were people who I did not expect to stand beside me who did. And you found out who your friends really are. And while I would have rather discovered that some other way, <laughs> it was a blessing. Uh, and I, while I can count them on one hand, I actually met people inside who were worth knowing, who I wouldn't have met any other way, and who I'm still friends with today, despite what got us all there. Uh, believe it or not, they tend to be moral people despite the mistakes they made to get themselves there. Uh, we all make mistakes, and some of us make mistakes that land us in prison. That doesn't mean your life is over. It doesn't mean your character is permanently and forever bad. Um, and in, in fact, along those lines, I want to tell you this one story. Um, my mother died while I was in custody. In fact, the day they took me away to send me into federal custody, uh, I was on the phone with her when she informed me that she had ovarian cancer and it was rather advanced and it, they didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, within four months, she was dead. And that was devastating, as you can imagine. And uh, I was in Lompoc, California at this federal facility there. And uh, the priest came to me when I was in the library and I kind of knew what this was about. And uh, he gave me the news and allowed me to talk on the phone to my dad. And when that was over, uh, I couldn't help but just cry and, uh, and be devastated as you would expect. And I knew also at the same time, however, this is not a place where you want to show weakness. Right. And, uh, and so I tried to go find an out of the way place to be by myself with my grief. But you can't hide like that in a place like that. People know. I mean, if anything else, there were people in the library with me when the priest came and got me, and they kind of figured what was going on. And fortunately, there was still enough humanity in those prisoners at that security level that they figured exactly what was going on with me, and they were human enough to let me have that space. They, they cleared out the six-man cell that I was in. I got it all to myself. I was there crying. And then about 15 minutes later, probably the scariest guy in the whole place comes walking in and there's nobody there but me and him. And I would never have any reason to speak with him about anything. And I'm wondering what the heck this is about. And suddenly I'm scared. I'm like, okay, I have to focus on survival here. What is this about? And he walks directly over to me. And he says, you and me got something in common. And I'm so institutionalized at this moment. I'm thinking this is something bad, but he's actually there to commune with me because he has lost family members. Ah. And, and he tells me that. And it's the most, one of the most beautiful things that's ever happened in my life, despite where it happened. Uh, he just talked with me about how he'd lost three brothers and his mother and all this stuff. And he understood. And he said, dude, if you ever want to talk about it, you come find me. Wow. And I said, well, well, thank you. I mean, I, I was, I was floored. I, I didn't know what to say. So this points out that even in a dark place, if you are respectful with people and you have good relations, you can still exist in a humane and respectful way. There. And, uh, and I will never forget that. Wow. That is touching. That is, that is cool that, that, yeah, even in that place there, yeah, we're all still just human critters, aren't we? Yeah. I, but he was willing to come talk with me because I had a good reputation because I wasn't involved in any of the stuff that causes trouble. You know, I was keeping to myself. I hung out with the old guys, wasn't involved in the drugs or the gambling and the sex. You know, I was, I was like the Mormon of the bunch almost. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> wow. Well, what else haven't I asked you that is important? 
Oh, well, shoot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, that's been so long in the past. That's like 25 years ago for me that uh, it's no longer part of my daily life and I don't think about it as much as I used to, although I have no problem sharing it with people. But yeah, as time goes on, uh, yeah, I would have to spend time to think up important things to impart. And but, how long uh, were you? How long were you on the inside? Uh, five years. Okay. Uh, basically, I was given a seventy-two month sentence, and in the federal system at that time, and I think it's still the same, that for good behavior, you're able to get up to fifteen percent taken off. So really, it was like a. A six-year sentence, but you know they took off one year because I behaved most of the time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dean, for coming on and sharing your experience. And whether we would talk about uh, prison stuff or other interesting things in life, would you be willing to come on again sometime? Of course. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and. Uh, I'll look forward to speaking with you again sometime. Yeah, and uh, next time you're out here in Arizona, we'll have to visit again. Amen, brother.
Chino.